Um, and I think actually accounting has substantially improved. I think the problem with accounting now isn't the accounts, it's whether or not anybody's actually reading the things and, and doing anything about it. And I'm going to give you five examples of that to, uh, to maybe bring you slightly more up to date, but certainly a lot more up to date than accounting for growth. These five that I've got on the slide, IBM, Clorox, Mondelez, Carillion, uh, and Wirecard. Comrade, could you take us on, please? Um, in the 2009 annual report for, uh, for IBM, when we were analyzing it, we discovered a $1.9 billion mistake. Um, now, it's quite a lot of money, um, even if you say it quickly. And uh, we were analyzing this company in 2010 because we were setting up Fundsmith and we were looking at it as a possible investment. And uh, I'm not absolutely, I don't know for sure that we're the only people who spotted it, but I think we are. Um, because what we did when we spotted it is, first of all, Julian and I discussed it to see whether we thought we both agreed, and we did. Then Julian rang up the IR department of IBM and said, look, um, I've got a bit of a question. Can you tell us about this? Um, and Julie, eventually, they did the thing that all our departments do, which is call, get somebody to call us back who knew about it. And we said, you're absolutely right. The cash flow is wrong by $1.9 billion. And we said, oh, that's, isn't that interesting? Um, apart from not uh, giving us any great enthusiasm for IBM, we said, anybody else sort of rang up, pointed this out, asked any questions about it? Nope, not a soul, they said. So if anybody else did uh, spot it, they certainly didn't bring up and ask about it. And ironically, at the same time, Warren Buffett, the sage of Omaha, was buying his stake. Now, I, you know, I'm fairly confident that Warren's people weren't reading these reports either, because if we go on to the next slide, this is a slide which covers the Berkshire Hathaway ownership of IBM. And I'm not saying all of this is down to a mistake in the accounts, very far from it. It's just, it's one of those straws in the wind. Uh, as it were. You can see that uh, from the, the purchase of Bart Hathaway's position, uh, which was in the second quarter of, uh, of 2011 on there, so if you look at that, I think uh, Connor's got a point, we can point you at roughly where it is. We've got a red line, which is the IBM uh, share price, which as you can see is flat line to going gently downhill, and a comparison with the gray line, which is the S&P 500 for that period. It was an utterly disastrous uh, investment for, for the uh, bubble chatway. And I'm not trying to knock Warren Buffett at all, as you rightly said. I, I think, um, you know, A, you know, I've studied him for many years, right back to 1979, uh, and his, uh, what he's done is incredibly good. Um, but uh, it's one of those missteps which you certainly had enough to, so nobody was reading the accounts. Take us on, please, comrade. Um, not only does nobody read the accounts, but nobody seems to care very much either. Um, Clorox, which is a company we have owned, American fast moving consumer products business. Um, in 2014, the number that they showed for their treasury stock purchase was a positive, not a negative in the cash flow. Like, how can that be? So again, the usual form occurred. We rang them up and said, to, you know, we're, I think we were shareholders at the time. Um, can you explain this to us? And they said, oh, it's a, it's a mistake. We've put the number in the wrong way around. We said, ah, oh, couldn't do anything about it. And they said, yep, we're going to correct it. We'll make a, a, a statement uh, in the 2015 account uh, correcting it. It wasn't. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking at this stuff. So it's not that the accounts are problematic so much as uh, what are people doing with them. Um, Carillion, this is the UK construction business uh, which went bust. Um, this is a, a slide which just shows the net income, the net profits you can see over a number of years prior to its uh, going bust. Uh, the free cash flow, this is the cash that it generates prior to the um, uh, uh, the payment of the dividend, so after paying for everything he has to pay out for, and then the cash conversion number, that's the uh, free cash flow divided by the net income, because not all profits arrive in cash. People have other things that they have to spend things on, like working capital and capital expenditure. Uh, not all profits, as I would say, are created equal. And uh, clearly what we like to see, and what actually the companies in our portfolio have got, is 100% cash conversion. All the profits arrive in cash. Uh, but you can see here, this is a pretty patchy record. You know, the, the cash conversion was minus 18.6%. So for every pound of profits, minus 20p appeared. Minus 80%. And now things, that's pretty uh, eye-catching. Things did get a bit better, but you can see it didn't get an awful lot better. They never managed to produce 100% of profits in cash. Uh, and by 2016, they were back down to the point where they were uh, producing uh, only 37% of their profits in cash. This is a sign. Profits are a lot easier to manufacture than cash, basically. Um, and this is a clear sign that all is not well with the company. If we, I don't know what the number is cumulative. We ended up the five years profits and the five years cash flow on that table. But clearly, that sort of cash conversion is pointing you to a problem 
almost certainly the problem is the profits are not real. Um, can you take us on, comrade? And you can see from here, if you just read that and sold at any time during the years that that cash flow was poor and beginning to deteriorate again, you could have missed that nice cliff fall that occurred in 2017. Uh, it didn't require accounting reform to do this. It just required actually doing a few simple calculations from the accounts which were being supplied to you. So you might query not whether the profits are being fixed, which was evidence, but the information was there in the accounts for you to do the work. No, it looks like we've missed, I'm sorry, we've dropped a slide, which is Mondelez. Um, it's basically about companies who make adjustments. One of the things to be very wary of uh, is companies who, when they're reporting, and you'll see this is, uh, there's a pandemic of this, never mind a pandemic of COVID in the world, uh, they'll report their actual numbers, their gap numbers, generally accepted account of purpose numbers, but they'll actually spend far more time on so-called adjusted numbers. Um, my memory serves me well, the, uh, uh, the Mondelez one spent something like 32 pages on adjustments in the results we were looking at, uh, compared with just four or five pages for the actual gap results. And of course, I mean, you needn't um, trouble you the, you too much to think about the fact that um, when uh, people make adjustments, they take out the bad stuff. So they try to get us to believe that the reorganization expenses, the litigation expenses, um, the write downs that they have to make, et cetera, et cetera, are um, uh, in some way adjustments that you should ignore to the fictional adjusted profit number that they're trying to get you to, pre to present. Uh, Mondelez has been a particularly egregious um, uh, offender in this regard, particularly under previous management. Uh, but the pharmaceutical industry uh, on the whole is quite bad at it as well. If you look at the pharmaceutical companies, you'll find that they very often report adjusted uh, profits, which are seemingly accepted by the investment community, which exclude things like the write-off of intangibles, um, litigation expenses related to product liability and, and uh, you know, uh, the restructuring expenses from M&A. In other words, some very big things which are a regular part of their business. Um, and therefore, it's, uh, it's not the accounts which are the problem, it's the adjusted numbers. Always be wary of anyone who tries to get you when they're talking about investment or analysing a company to do it on the basis of the slideshow that the management put forward. Because the slideshow almost always has a little asterisk by the numbers that says adjusted. And you look at the bottom of the slides and say, have a look at the actual accounts. Go and get the report and accounts or the 10K if it's an American company and read the basic source material. That's what you need to do. Um, finally, um, Wirecard, this has obviously been a very big uh, incident, German uh, financial services business in the payment processing area, which has been disastrous. There are plenty of warnings, um, more red flags than the People's Liberation Army. The analyst uh, publication published on Wirecard first in July 2014 with 42 follow-up notes on this, warning about this fraud, yet nobody took any notice. Conrad, right, take this on. Um, that's what the share price did during the same period. The problem isn't whether or not the signs are there for people to analyze. They are whether or not they're doing the work and whether anyone is taking any notice. You know, people from investors in Wirecard to investors in Carillion through to investors in IBM are basically got blinkers on when it comes to this information. The information, I think, is by and large pretty good. It's the use of it, which is the problem, or the, or the misuse or the non-use of it. 